Good afternoon and welcome to today's seminar, which is being offered as a part of the CTS Fall Transportation Seminar Series. My name is Linda Prizen and I'm with CTS. Um, so CTS and the ITS Institute offers this seminar series each Thursday afternoon from 3.30 to 4.30 in this room, Mechanical Engineering 11.30, um, each week this fall. And seminars are open to the public and practitioners and staff and students, faculty, and anyone who's just interested in hearing about research related to transportation here at the U. Um, this particular seminar is being offered as, a, as in conjunction with a meeting of the CTS Transportation and Infrastructure Council. And a schedule of, of upcoming seminars is available in, um, at the CTS website. And at the end of the seminar, I'll announce next uh, week's topic. Just a couple of housekeeping items. Today's seminar is being broadcast on the web in addition to our live um, presentation here in this room. We'll, we'll ask that you hold all questions until the end of the seminar. Um, we'll have a Q&A session, and, and you'll notice that this microphone isn't projecting here in this room, but it is projecting out to our web audience. So during the Q&A, if you're in the room, you have a question, I'll ask you to use um, this mic or the one that Joe will be bringing around. And then if you're watching online, you may enter your questions by typing um, into the box. I think it's at the upper right-hand corner of your screen. And I, I, I guess at this point in time, I'll introduce our Transportation Infrastructure Research Council Chair, and that's Mike Sheehan um, from Olmstead County, and he will introduce today's uh, pre pre presentation speakers. Thank you, Linda. This afternoon, we got a cold presentation. We've got two gentlemen going to give us a good presentation here this afternoon. The first gentleman is Art Schultz. Art received his uh, BS de degree in civil engineering from Southern Methodist University and an MS and PH degrees in civil engineering from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And Steve Wachowicz received his BS with honors, his MS and PhD in, aerona in aeronautical engineering from the University of Illinois in 1993-94 and 2000 respectively. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Art to get us started. And again, we thank both of them for being here today. It uh, really is a pleasure to be here. Um, this is always a very good audience to talk to. And uh, today, I'm, Steve and I are going to talk to you about a project that we've been working on uh, actually, most of the work was done by Andrew Gassino, who's sitting back here, uh, and, and who's here to make sure that we present his work properly. He's the doctoral student who's uh, doing a lot of this work. Um, the uh, topic is a bit uh, pie in the sky, in a sense. Uh, we, we're looking at uh, transferring uh, structural control technology uh, as a way of extending uh, bridge life, uh, particularly for steel bridges that may have problems with uh, fatigue issues. Uh, it's a technology that may be still some while before uh, it gets to be developed and we're very uh, we believe that it's a very promising technology and uh, we were able to make a compelling case to the Center for Transportation Structures to provide us uh, with some seed money to get this started. Um, the topic is response modification for enhanced uh, operation and safety of bridges uh, and as Motivation, uh, well, brief outline of what, what I'll be talking about. Uh, my part of the presentation will be maybe 15 minutes, uh, give you essentially why we should be doing this and why this um, seems to make a lot of sense. And then Steve will talk to you about the details of the structural control and how this could be implemented uh, in order to reduce stress ranges in existing steel bridges that are in service. Uh, so I'll talk about a number of topics, uh, including some issues that are essential for response modification, including the kinds of vulnerabilities that may be addressed by this, uh, some loading models, a little bit on monitoring systems, and then the response modification techniques. I'll talk about a bridge model that we selected in order to do our parameter studies, and then I'll turn it over for Steve to continue the presentation. So everyone knows that we have an aging infrastructure. Everyone knows we have uh, bridges that are subjected to more traffic and heavier traffic uh, than they were originally designed for. Uh, so I'm preaching to the choir here. Everyone knows that we have a lot of bridges in Minnesota and throughout the U.S. that are structurally deficient or obsolete. And we all know that replacing this, this inventory is cost prohibitive. In Minnesota, we have a lot of steel bridges that have reached an age where they either develop problems or are reaching 
the end of their uh, originally intended uh, life. The question is, can we stretch this out further, and can we operate these in a safe manner? Uh, and we believe that the combination of response modification along with health monitoring can be used for this purpose and can be used very effectively. Um, these are currently used in seismic applications in order to control seismic forces in uh, buildings and even in bridges it's been used to try to control the ends of girders from falling from uh, their supports in the event of lateral motion during an earthquake. But we believe that they can be used for reducing deflections and stresses in bridge members and therefore mm -hmm. Uh, it will allow these bridges to have a service life that uh, may get them well beyond what they would see otherwise because of details that provide stress concentrations. And with steel bridges, there's always a detail that's going to provide stress concentration, in some cases, faster than others. Uh, the notion of uh, response modification I presented here sort of in a cartoon form. And so bridges are designed to carry loads and this loading uh, introduces response in the bridge in the form of deflections and stresses and so on. If we have a monitoring system that's able to pick this up and also a way of evaluating how important this loading is, in many cases it may be a stress calculation, um, then this information can be fed to a control system that can determine how to change the parameters of the response modification system. I have yet to define that and I'll get to that uh, in such a way that it generates control forces that reduce the response of the bridge. Um, so to talk about this, I'd like to briefly mention some vulnerabilities that we think might be addressed by this, as well as uh, some information on loading and monitoring system, as well, and some modification devices that might be applicable here. Um, some time ago for uh, MnDOT, I was uh, asked to do some work with uh, Adam Lindbergh to classify for steel bridges uh, details that are prone to fatigue and fracture. As part of that project, we surveyed 30-odd uh, uh, DOTs throughout the country or, or other bridge owners to try to get a sense from them what their experience has been. And out of the survey, we got a list of, a prioritized list of what DOTs throughout the country believe are the most problematic uh, details for steel bridges. Um, among these is the partial length cover plate. Um, here you see where the cover plate is ended and what can happen with this detail. There's a stress concentration that's generated there that can fracture the flange and that can penetrate into the web. Um, the transverse stiffener web gap detail, um, when you have adjacent girders connected by a stiff diaphragm, if the connection plate for the diaphragm is not welded to the top flange, then uh, relative differential deflection can produce rotation in the, in the diaphragm that can produce out-of-plane distortion of the web gap uh, and very large stresses that eventually leads to cracking in, uh, in this region. Um, insufficient cope radius, if this is a very tight radius, th there's a large stress concentration from which a crack can initiate and penetrate into the web very quickly. And there are others. Um, uh, when the tied arches are connected to floor beams, there are stress concentrations there that can lead to cracking as well. Uh, or stringer to beam bracket connections. So all of these examples that I've shown you here are cases where stress concentrations are leading to fracture. In some cases, the, when fracture occurs, it occurs slowly enough uh, that they can be addressed. In other cases, the fracture may be occurring uh, at a very uh, high rate. Um, such would be a case if stresses are very high, and it also depends on the connection detail. Uh, but these are cases that we think we can address. There are other bridge, uh, other bridge problems, like uh, particularly shear cracking and concrete, that could possibly benefit from this technology as well. And so we began to think, well, what are the issues that matter here? Well, we need to worry about loading and how bridges are loaded. We looked at uh, ASHTO literature. Um, if you have information on the annual average daily truck traffic, uh, misspelled here, it's ADTT. Um, there are impact factors that you need to worry about. You can either use what Ashto dictates or you can do a dynamic analysis like we did to try to take that into, uh, into a account. Um, we can also define loading other ways. We can use information from way in motion sensors um, or we can uh, develop site-specific loading for specific bridges for, from which information may be better known. Then what's the impact of this loading? Well, 
recent work uh, funded by the National Cooperative Highway Research Program uh, by Chattakai and Bowman uh, generated this fatigue life equation. Um, as with many of the fatigue life formulas that, are, uh, that have been used or are currently in use, fatigue life, Y in this case in years, is controlled by the magnitude of the effective stress. And if you can reduce this effective stress range, then you can increase the fatigue life. And this is, in this particular formula, is a raise to the third power. And so that's a huge uh, um, effect. A small reduction in the effective stress range here can lead to significant increases in fatigue life. And that's the principal motivation for um, the work here. Now, how do you know what's happening in a bridge? Uh, well, we can certainly do lots of analysis, and design analysis is done to the in order to design the bridge. Post fact, uh, you know, you can do analysis for load rating, but that's always a troubling thing. And so technologies have evolved over the years. Um, particularly for cracking, acoustic emission has become uh, very useful for uh, following uh, cracking. Uh, accelerometers, if you're doing a control system design or modal analysis. Strain gauges, if you want measurements of strain directly, and there's a variety of these depending on what it is that you're looking for. Uh, you can use load cells to measure loads directly, but these are uh, intrusive, difficult to install. Um, you can use weigh in motion systems, and there's quite a variety of those uh, where you use sensors or transducers to get the vehicle weight. There's a possibility you can even use traffic camera data um, in, in such a way as to estimate what the loading is on the bridge. Uh, for our purpose at hand, what we need the monitoring system for is to define the response at specific locations where we think we have problems. And we need to keep track of that in order to determine how the response system needs to change its characteristics to try to reduce the, the stresses in the bridge. Now, there's a, a number of ways you can do that. Uh, you can use passive devices. We probably wouldn't refer to it that way, but there's retrofits fall in this category. Um, for example, Quite often for the distortional fatigue problem, angle brackets are used uh, to connect the uh, web to the top flange where this weld was not introduced in the first place. Uh, and that way you can control the distortion and get rid of the problem. Um, it can be difficult to install these, uh, especially if you have to go into uh, the deck and you have to remove portions of the deck. You may have to close lanes in the bridge. Um, in other cases, it may be more easily installed. Um, there are passive dampers, just like you have in a doorway, uh, 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 just a, a, a fluid-filled cylinder. Um, or you can use masses as a way of uh, providing damping. Or you can use a control device. These are, character are differentiated from the passive dampers in that they have the ability to change their characteristics. Um, you can use active devices. However, these require a lot of power, and so we don't think they're applicable here. Or semi-active devices. Uh, that just need to change their characteristics uh, occasionally. And uh, the, they might uh, control a mass, the, lo the location, the position of a mass, or the amount of uh, the orifice through which a fluid is traveling in a uh, typical dash pot, or electro-rheological devices where uh, the fluid itself responds to uh, an electrical current and the viscosity changes so that the damping force uh, in the system will change uh, depending upon the signal that you send it. Now, the notion for this was really tried before, uh, at least in the passive sense. In um, uh, the late 90s, Patton uh, developed a system where he would place uh, essentially a stiffening device at the bottom of a girder of a bridge. Um, these uh, brackets that you see here uh, are just there to uh, support this device, which includes an inline source of damping and stiffness. Now, it's a passive device in that the stiffness and the damping are not changed. They're just whatever they are when you install it. And every time the uh, bridge girder deforms in flexure under loading, uh, these brackets will rotate and they will stretch or attempt to stretch or compress the member that's connecting these two and therefore actuate the devices. Um, he was able to uh, provide safe life extension of 50 years uh, at a cost of only 10% of replacing the bridge. So if you, want a, if you have access to provide something like this, in other words, if access underneath isn't a problem, uh, then this is a way of extending the life with uh, a device that's relatively simple. Now, w uh, one of the problems with the patent device is that 
uh, they have to be very long. Um, and so one of the things that, that we did is to come up with a way of in increasing the deformation that you get when there's a slope here and a slope there in the bridge and these tr tend to separate or come together, then we've introduced basically a scissor jack. And this scissor jack, the horizontal movement of these two ends, becomes vertical movement here. And so we introduce our device in between those two points and the device will be either shortened or extended every time there is uh, changes in slope in the girder at these two points. Um, and that's the, the notion that we are investigating here. Uh, this device will add stiffness and damping. Um, there is a magnification factor that's a function of this angle beta, and the shallower that angle is, the greater the magnification. So while we can shorten these devices from what uh, Patton originally proposed, still, it still requires some horizontal distance over which they should be placed. And the device itself that's placed in here will have stiffness, will provide stiffness as well as damping to the system. And there's a variety of these, and I'll let Steve talk about those as well. So we needed uh, to do parameter studies, and we didn't want to do this just on an ideal, I mean, an, uh, uh, an imaginary bridge model or something like that. We had access, because of a prior project, to a computer model of an actual bridge, an in-service bridge. So um, we decided to try this on this actual bridge. Now, the bridge that we selected is a bridge in the Twin Cities metro area. It has no history nor no expectation of performance problems. It simply was a bridge for which we had a model. It takes a long time to build a finite element model of, of, a, of any bridge, uh, particularly a large bridge. Um, we had also determined from previous analysis that there are stress concentrations in this bridge. It's a, it's a tied arch bridge with a steel box girder serving as the ties for the arches and where the hangers attached to the tie box um, girder, uh, there are locations there that have stresses that are higher than at other regions. So these stress concentrations could, be, could lead to fatigue, not necessarily in this bridge, but in any bridge if you have a stress concentration that could eventually lead to fatigue. So we wanted to see if this device could be used, this modification device, to reduce these stresses. And so we uh, analyzed uh, an implementation of the device across the connections that were the most vulnerable. Um, for those of you that are familiar with the Twin Cities, you probably know what the bridge is. It's really not important wh what the bridge is. Here's an aerial view of the bridge and a br uh, view of the bridge from the roadway uh, with a closer view of where the hangers connect to the uh, box girder. Our analysis had shown, um, well, this is the uh, moment envelope uh, for uh, uh, loading along one lane. Um, the, it, it's sort of odd looking because the flexibility of the arch tends to distort the shape of the moment diagram and so the maximum moments aren't in fact in the middle of the span. They're actually uh, at sort of third or quarter points. And at these locations we found through an, a, a detailed finite element analysis of a segment of the box girder that there were very large stresses or larger, I shouldn't say very large, larger stresses there than elsewhere. Um, this is a close-up view of where the hanger is connected to the tie box girder showing you where these uh, higher stresses are. So the intention was to use uh, the response modification device that I just showed you at uh, that location, one of these locations to see if we could in fact reduce the stress level and to try to estimate how much increase in bridge life could be obtained by reducing the stress levels at that location. And at this point, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Steve, and he'll actually give you the important details. So thank you, Art. Um, <clears throat> I don't know about important details, but actual results. And uh, uh, a lot of hard work by Andrew. Um, I'll hopefully get to uh, in my part of the presentation. But what I'd like to do to start off is give a little more detail about the scissor jack that um, Art spoke about and why it's really necessary for the civil engineering applications uh, that we're imp interested in, specifically this response modification for bridges, but uh, this general need uh, is true also in building structural control, which isn't the case when you're looking at uh, vibration isolation, for instance, in mechanical and aerospace systems. Uh, after that, we'll get to the actual meat 
and results of what happens when we apply, uh, in this case, four of these devices to the bridge uh, that Art spoke to in terms of lifetime extension um, for a variety of different configurations of the apparatus. And I'll talk more about that. Uh, the next piece is looking at the effects of varying the frequency of our excitation. And this will hopefully motivate uh, why we're investigating in conjunction with uh, uh, Raj Rajamani and mechanical engineering here, this notion of varying the parameters, going from something that's simply a passive device in our modification approach to something that's either semi-active or active. Uh, and then wrap up with some conclusions. So this scissor jack, Art already had a picture up here. Um, just to give a little more backstory to, to this device, uh, Bill Patton was a faculty member at University of Oklahoma and was very successful with this approach, as Art has said. Uh, this is an in-service bridge. This is actually over I-35, a small creek in Oklahoma uh, with this, and this isn't just computational results. This is actual predictions from uh, uh, test data from this bridge of 50 years for 10% of the cost. Um, unfortunately, this, well, this project was funded at the level of a million dollars in 1999 by a line item in the federal budget. But tragically, Bill Patton passed away very quickly uh, from lung cancer within six months after that uh, money was received. And this work just stopped. So that's, we, we found the work, we started there, but What's needed here, um, as Art alluded to, is not a simple response modification device. That is, we can't take a spring and a damper combination connected to ground to a bridge uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, paramount of which it's not practical for the bridge in particular we're talking about. But more importantly, uh, there's kind of two opposing trends going on with civil uh, structures um, when we're trying to control them rather than mechanical or aerospace structures. One, the scale of the structure. A plane, sure, it's huge. <clears throat> but the bridge, if we start dealing with long span uh, bridges, our scale uh, over what the response is needed to be investigated is far larger than many other mechanical systems. However, so we have this large scale going on. But for typical normal service loads, our deflections, velocities, accelerations seen by the bridge, uh, for instance, under uh, the Ashto truck loading, are very small, all right? Well, regardless of what kind of control device we put in there, if we only have a small stroke length or equivalently a velocity differential across these elements that's very small, we're not going to get much control authority, which we absolutely need to control something with as much inertia and mass as uh, the bridge in question. So this is what really motivated the, the use of the scissor jack. This is just two other pictures. Uh, same principle that applies to any car jack uh, uh, in terms of changing your flat tire is what we're using here. Now in terms of where it's been applied previously, the only place we found in the literature uh, in structural engineering uh, where something on the scale that we're interested in has been used previously was in a seismic problem and this is a uh, frame that was being tested. And these are very similar, in fact, identical to what we've been implementing in our models on the bridge. But in these uh, scissor jacks, in this case, this frame is being subjected to a ground motion, earthquake ground motion in the laboratory. And these uh, scissor jacks have a damping device, a fuse that uh, is designed to dissipate energy and take it away from the motion of uh, the frame as it undergoes these earthquake undergoes this earthquake excitation. So we wanted to try to apply a similar technique to bridges, which to our knowledge um, hadn't been done before. Um, and Art gave the end result of this, which is a nice clean formula, uh, describing how much magnification goes on for a given geometry of uh, the scissor jack. Okay? Now, this, this is a very clean formula, but it took quite a bit of analysis, which I'm not going to go into here, uh, that Andrew performed. But I do want to point out two other facts here or ex uh, expand upon what Art spoke about with this magnification factor. One, it does take the small displacement seen by uh, the bridge, 
the structure in general, and amplify those to where this device sits inside this parallelogram so that we can develop uh, sufficient forces um, to be used in, in modifying the response of the, the bridge structure. However, it also takes this force and using the same magnification factor, uh, that force that's developed in the modification device is amplified when it's fed back into the structure. And it's the same magnific magnification factor that's just a property of the geometry of, of the system. In terms of how we did this, and this is a bit of a verification, uh, uh, a sanity check that what we did analytically does work for uh, uh, a very simple system, uh, but we have verified this empirically for, for this large-scale bridge model that I'll get to in a few minutes. Just took a simple, simply supported beam with a point load at center span and attached one of our uh, uh, proposed devices where we had uh, this picture has a damper, but in fact it was just a simple spring inside of there. <clears throat> and compared the results that we got from our analytical solution, which was derived from putting a point load at the center of the beam and solving uh, the classical beam bending equation. Um, and we can, with not too much trouble, come up with, well, I probably undersold that, with a lot of trouble, but uh, it's doable to come up with that simple magnification formula we got. But this is the empirical verification. A lot of data here. We compared the behavior of this uh, magnification device uh, for two different types of attachment configurations. One, which is very theoretical, is that uh, the end of the scissor jack is attached rigidly to the beam, which is not going to happen in practice. But it does make our calculations uh, um, more tractable, at least in the analytical case, where we derive that magnification factor. We also looked at a configuration very similar to, in fact, exactly the same as what Patton used, which is the scissor jack is connected back to the bridge deck through an uh, inverted truss-like uh, connection. And what we saw with the results is, separate from uh, the reaction that you see at the supports here, the second line, uh, the behavior is almost identical. And most importantly, the predicted magnification factor uh, from our simple formula, which was 12.5, is verified, again, almost exactly with the results that we're getting from a, a numerical finite element model of the beam. Um, so with this, we were relatively confident that we could start to address or attack the problem that we're most interested in. Now, when we did this, again, using this tight arch bridge that uh, Art spoke uh, in a little more detail about earlier, we didn't look at the rigid connection at all, mainly because we're trying to come as close or closer to reality in terms of implementing this device uh, uh, as possible. And instead, we look purely at connecting the um, modification device, which is located right here inside our scissor jack. And this combination together, along with these truss connections, we're calling a response modification apparatus. So the key here is, unlike the results, although they were promising by patent, um, we have this magnification uh, mechanical amplifier uh, in our uh, approach. And then the uh, effects of that will become clear once I get uh, down here a few slides with this tight arch bridge. So again, same pictures, Art showed better ones, actually. Um, we have the moment envelope uh, that's present under a truck loading for this bridge. Uh, another picture, not much to say there. Um, but what I'd like to do before getting into the results is speak more about the actual model, give some details, some things that we looked at. Um, we had a progression of models that developed over the course of uh, three to six months. We started with a much simpler system, which is we only applied or uh, augmented the bridge with a single one of these modification devices, uh, whereas in our final uh, model in our final design, we have opposing pairs of these, so a total of four of these devices uh, situated on our bridge. We went from one to two to four as we gained confidence. Uh, in addition, we started with a, a much simpler model of the bridge the, without the deck involved. So just the steel superstructure along with the uh, hangers uh, and the arch uh, elements uh, included. 
But what we arrived at uh, in our most current model is something on the order of 30,000 degrees of freedom. That includes the deck, which is modeled by shell elements, the steel stu superstructure, which is embedded in there uh, using uh, three-dimensional frame elements along with uh, tension-only uh, elements for the hangers. Okay, so it's a, a reasonably sized model. Um, for a typical analysis, what did a truck load take to run on your computer, just to give people an idea? You didn't have the mic, sorry. So about 15 minutes, it's, it's a reasonable amount of time uh, to do this analysis. Um, when we start wanting to do optimization and control, uh, 15 minutes might not be reasonable, and, and we're working on that. A um, couple other things we looked at is the effect of, we started with no damping in the superstructure uh, and got positive results, but then we included damping to see how robust the approach was. It turns out there wasn't much effect, but it needed to be checked. Um, these I've already uh, covered. Um, final thing in terms of detail here is how we size the modification device. So within each of these four, and we chose uh, for simplicity's sake that they were identical, uh, we have a linear spring and a linear dash pot sitting in here where the spring has a stiffness of 110 kips per inch. And this dash pot, this linear, linear viscous damper, has a uh, proportionality constant of three kips per second, kip seconds per inch. And those parameters were chosen so that um, Given the response of the bridge under the uh, truck loading, the Ashto uh, spec, that the displacements developed by the bridge and transmitted to the device uh, would be such that we, um, the device would be able to, to provide a uh, uh, reasonable amount of forces uh, in comparison to what's commercially available for a damper in this range. So this was sized so that the damper would damper spring combination would provide on the order of anywhere, well, between 20 and 50 uh, uh, tons of force, which there are uh, several options there. Turns out it provides for the analysis that we're doing. Um, uh, it was sized very conservatively because the forces uh, imparted by the device turn out to be uh, roughly a tenth of that, something on the order of five to seven uh, tons of force. Uh, for one of the configurations. Um, I think Art covered all of this in detail. We didn't use this importance factor or amplification factor in our analysis because we were doing direct numerical integration uh, and sending a truck across the bridge. But there are a few other details here which will be important uh, uh, in a few minutes when I talk about the frequency response analysis we performed. One is to keep in mind the distance from the astro spec of, uh, well, distance between the first and second axle of an HS20 truck, which is 14 feet, and a similar distance, but between the second and third, and this is going to turn out to be uh, the most severe load case that we're going to look at uh, in a few minutes with the frequency response. And that distance here, which it's, I don't think, coming through on the slide, uh, it's V, and that's uh, equal to 30 feet. So we've got 14 and 30. So the total length of the, tr of the truck is 44 feet. Okay. So let me get to uh, results. Okay. Now, this is just one table of, of, a, of a large parameter study uh, that we performed um, where we looked at several different things. One, we looked at three different families of apparatuses that we called short, medium, and long, which as their titles would suggest, is just what those jack lengths are <coughs> and how much in, in uh, comparison to the total bridge length the apparatus is, well, what's the relative size. Uh, these are results from what we call the longest apparatus, which I believe was 60 feet, uh, whereas the total bridge length is uh, 384 feet, okay, so roughly a sixth of the bridge. Uh, so we had one variation where we're looking at size of apparatuses, or apparati, I don't know which one it is. But um, in addition to that, uh, we relax this assumption that all of the members in the scissor jack were rigid, and rigid, uh, rigid members connected with hinges, okay? As we felt that was probably overly 
uh, optimistic in terms of what results we get out and definitely not uh, uh, a practical solution. You're not going to have perfectly rigid members uh, when you build one of these devices uh, and implement it on a bridge. So here, let me just make a note, this, this leg stiffness isn't truly in infinity in the models. We just make it, uh, I think it was six orders of magnitude larger than any member in the model. So for all intents and purposes, intents and purposes it is rigid. And when we do that with those stiffness and damping parameters that I spoke about, the moment reduction we receive is, or arrive at is almost half. We get a re moment reduction uh, from the implementation of this device of 43%, which translates into a safe life extension of 84 years. Okay? And for this entire row here, the way we calculated this safe life extension is uh, we had to assume some fatigue life for uh, the location we're interested in, where this maximum in this moment envelope, which has now been modified in this picture, located here. And since the bridge is symmetric, uh, also uh, in a similar location on the other ed end of the deck, we assumed a, a fatigue life of 50 years. Now this is just by we wanted to get answers out and see how the method worked. Uh, there isn't a connection to uh, any true knowledge about uh, the connection on this bridge having a fatigue life of 50 years. But if we do that and factor in um, the information that the bridge has been in service for 31 years and apply that fatigue formula that Art showed earlier, um, by implementing and augmenting the bridge with these, in, in this case, four modification devices, we increase the safe life of the bridge. If we assume that this location of moment concentration is driving the lifetime uh, from 19 years by 84 years, so it would last for 100 years. All right, well, that number uh, has implications in terms of the overall approach. Um, which I'll get to also in our future work sections. But as I said, this is the best case scenario. All right? We have rigid members. What happens if we start to look at real sections for these um, uh, members of the scissor jack? All right? So for a variety of sections, five here, you can see that we get decreased performance. I mean, going all the way for, in the worst case, down to just a year of life extension. But a reasonable sized member, uh, this last column, we're still getting on the order of over a decade in terms of extension of life uh, uh, and a moment reduction on the order of 16.4%. Uh, now this is only one set of results. As I said, there were three families we looked at, uh, these long apparatuses, short and medium. This was uh, the best of the bunch, but 60 feet is an awful long distance, so some might ask, is that reasonable? Uh, I will say, without going through a whole another set of two tables, the medium and short provided good results, not quite as uh, uh, good um, as this long set of apparatuses. There we saw lifetime extensions, for instance, in this case of the last W14-145 uh, of seven to nine years extension. Okay. But Still, a decade could mean a great deal. The other thing I want to note here is what happens if we take out that amplification device and go back to what uh, here we've called the patent system, which was applied successfully on that very short span bridge. The span there was on the order of 50 to 75 feet, maybe a little bit longer. Here we're dealing with a bridge length of uh, 384 feet. All right, so how would it uh, do? Okay, with the same set of stiffness and damping parameters that we used for our approach with Patton's approach without this amplifier. And you can see very minimal improvement. We're getting 1% uh, moment reduction, which translates into you know, something on the order of six to nine months. Okay? And similar trends were noted for all three families of apparatuses. It wasn't uh, solely coming from the fact that we had a large apparatus. We need this amplifier. <coughs> so there's ongoing work in terms of optimizing what the geometry is, what the section properties are. 
um, because ultimately we're not interested just in what this number is and how much moment reduction is. We need to see how much these things cost. Um, and Andrew has started some preliminary, excuse me, preliminary work into tying in how much steel is actually involved in each of these connections as a first cut at a cost optimization and doing a trade-off analysis of how many dollars per percent reduction, uh, which design gives us uh, the best solution. Okay, So this is just one set of results, but it does lead us into something else I want to talk about with the results. So we have, I hope, demonstrated some promise in reducing the moments here. But the question becomes, what happens if our loading changes? We're ch checking this with a direct numerical simulation of this, the uh, ASHDO speci speci uh, specification. Um, and what happens, for instance, if, we're, if we were to vary the vehicle speed? Um, and what is an equivalent forcing frequency that the bridge might see if our vehicle speed is changing from uh, the true ASHDO spec doesn't even have an embedded uh, vehicle speed. We have to pick something when we're doing our analyses. Uh, and what this plot portrays is the frequency response of the bridge, both with the device uh, added and without, okay, to a point load at center span of the bridge where we're varying the frequency of that excitation. Um, we're not doing a true moving load problem here because um, uh, to vary the frequency of that is uh, is difficult to do right now computationally within SAP. So what this is doing is we're fixing our load position and looking at the response due to this fixed load at the center span of varying frequency uh, at one of the problematic locations, at one of the locations of uh, maximum moment, which in this case was L3. All right, and y if you notice here, and the dotted line isn't making it out quite right or quite clear here, though, the <clears throat> dotted is nothing done to the bridge. We just run it, run the vehicle over the bridge, look at the response, what happens. Solid line is the response once we augment it with these four uh, devices. And you can see, for instance, in this frequency range, um, which is somewhere between, say, 12 and 16 radians per second, which would translate depending on what we're taking for our characteristic length. And the four characteristic lengths, this is the bridge length. So I think I said 380, it's 360, 358.5. This is the total bridge length. So this, this would be uh, the situation where if we took the load as we have one vehicle that starts on the bridge, we wait until the vehicle completely traverses the bridge and exit, then our load starts again. All right, not very realistic. And then these three other lengths are tied to the vehicles, these HS20 vehicles we're using in our analysis. One is the total length of the vehicle. One is this distance between the first and second uh, axles. And then finally, which is the most severe because the weight is in the back of the truck, the distance between the second and uh, third axles. All right, so for three different speeds, these are the corresponding frequencies of what the response would look like to a vehicle load uh, at this location. And you can see for all three of these, which again are sitting um, here, here, and then way out here, at least for these first two, we get something we don't want. The unmodified system uh, is actually doing a better job. Whereas if we've reduced our vehicle speed down into this regime, which would correspond anywhere between, say, 35 and a little less than 50 miles an hour, we get quite a bit of reduction. Now, this is a uh, on a log scale, this is a Bode plot. So this is several, it's about a factor of 20 or 30 there uh, for frequencies, forcing frequencies corresponding to a vehicle speed, um, again, between 35 and 50 miles an hour. Reason I'm including this is what it shows, this isn't our true load, we don't have a uh, a fixed load position oscillating the frequency, but it is demonstrating the dynamics of the system and the fact that varying the input, varying what type of truck loading that we might have, um, the frequency, how many trucks uh, are being or that are on the bridge at any one time, it would be advantageous if we could modify those parameters and not have them fixed with time. Okay, 
because if we were able to do that, for instance, depending on our knowledge of truck speed, if we knew our trucks were coming at the rate of uh, this regime of 35 to 50 miles an hour, this modification works quite well. This is a displacement plot, but we're getting a large reduction. However, that wouldn't be the case if we're back out here at 55 to say 60, 65 miles an hour where the parameters that we've chosen actually worsen our response. So this ability to adapt the properties, vary the stiffness and damping in the device is needed. All right, And there's a variety of approaches here. Uh, Art alluded to some of these and this is additionally, well, this is work that we've been talking to uh, uh, Raj Rajamani about which is coming up with semi-active devices to modify these parameters. And why semi-active and what are semi-active? Well, they're low power dampers and stiffening devices. Um, low power because we're on a bridge and accessibility and, and the amount of power that we have is not a lot for almost any bridge. Um, but the nice thing about semi-active, uh, any of these configurations is worst case, if you don't have the power uh, requirements, well, you don't meet the power uh, requirements of the device, they operate as a passive device and you don't introduce instabilities into the system. So this is one of the things um, that Andrew is now moving on into, which is we're going to start to modify these devices and not assume that we just have a simple passive spring damper combination in there and that we're going to be able to control those using information from uh, uh, instrumentation embedded on the bridge and although it's a bit pie in the sky include information from things such as weigh in motion data uh, from upstream uh, of the bridge potentially uh, traffic uh, camera data also any source of information that we could feed into this control system. So for instance, if we know we have a, uh, an overweight vehicle, a very overweight vehicle coming, can we append the properties of this device so that we lessen the impact on the bridge superstructure? So with that, I'd like to conclude with a few comments. One, uh, these are just two general statements. Um, we've demonstrated that this modification technique can greatly reduce the uh, effective moment range or equivalently effective stress range seen by a particular location, a particular detail on a bridge, which leads to at least a predicted long-term extension of bridge life. <clears throat> Future work, this first one I've already talked about, is we're looking at uh, not restricting ourselves to a passive device, but allowing these properties to vary and how we do that, how we would, how we would feed back the information with the power uh, constraints that we have on a bridge, not just for the device itself, but for the instrumentation involved. Um, I think there's some very interesting uh, questions that we're beginning to ask now that we have uh, a computational framework for doing this, which is uh, moving this from a pure computational model and start to try to increase um, the level of, uh, not fidelity of the model, but the level of realism in the model to include things such as practical designs. Can we actually include real connections uh, in our system rather than idealized ones for both how the device attaches to the superstructure but also within the scissor jack itself where this modification device is, is situated. Um, cost considerations and start to really do trade-off analyses of, okay, can I live with 20% moment reduction when it's fifth the cost and things like that. We're, we're just starting to be able to ask those type of questions. Um, two other areas, one Art alluded to and enumerated a large family of other vulnerabilities that we'd be interested in and this was just the first. I think the next immediate one is uh, Andrew, in conjunction with hopefully an undergraduate that has a Europe pending, um, is going to start to look at the differential deflection and the distortional, distortion induced fatigue problem um, and uh, start to apply a similar analogous um, approach to what we did here to that uh, type of vulnerability. And finally, if, if we can obtain funds, um, 
we ultimately would like to verify this in a laboratory. Um, the physical configuration, we have some strong ideas how to set up a representative bridge structure along with the modification device. The loading is, is another issue. Trying to mimic a moving load in a laboratory for a vehicle is, is uh, well, we're giving it thought. But, but our ultimate goal is to uh, provide at least some bench scale uh, laboratory verification that indeed the results that we're getting out of the model uh, would happen in practice without going to a bridge before we can do that. So with that, um, thank you. and. Uh, acknowledgements, CTS, of course, and this was funded under those two projects, and then our PhD student, Andrew Gastineau, uh, who's been tremendous on this. So thanks, and Art and I will be happy to answer any questions you might have. All right. Well, thanks to both of you, and, and so are there questions for the presenters today, Art and Steve? Thanks. I was wondering about, um, in the device you mentioned, the length scale of the device has a large impact. And I was wondering, did you vary also the um, height of the attachment? Because it seems like the longer that that is, the more effective the scissor structure would be, or were you limited by like a clearance dimension? For when I referred to the three different right. families, what we did there, and Andrew, correct me if I'm wrong, but the three, the way we, the similarity relationship we used is that we had the same magnification factor for all three. So as the medium and shorter are shorter length devices, the, the jack distance also shrunk in a proportional way so that for all three families, we still kept that M equal 30. Um, uh, but the issue of clearance is... The other thing that I was wondering is you could possibly invert it where instead of having it below the bridge, if you could flip it. And I realize your neutral axis will be close to the top, but somehow if you could still have it attached to the bottom flange, maybe you could get that same characteristic. It might be more ugly to drivers, but it, it's possible that you could get rid of the clearance problem maybe with that. I thought it was a really interesting idea. Yeah, that, that is a possibility. Flip it over and try to hide it with a rail. You know, we're, we're trying to look at this point at a very early stage to see what can we gain from it. Uh, uh, what is required of the system? What does the system need to look like? How big does it the, ha, do these devices have to be? There, uh, we haven't yet begun. We, we know of a couple of devices that are available in the marketplace, but we haven't done a very thorough search of all of the alternatives that could be available. Um, one of them is a, an electrical rheological device that's primarily for vehicle, heavy vehicle uh, applications, but could be used here. Other questions? Um, I don't. I don't know if maybe if it if it ever came up in a literature survey. Um, could there be any parallel to some systems that have been used in large scale buildings? I know there, there's a local company, MTS, back in the 70s or 80s. I think made some tune mass dampers for for two different sky, skyscrapers. Has that ever, have you ever looked at that? Uh, the, in terms of what we're applying here, uh, I mean, there's a, there's a long history of using vibration controllers, TMDs being one of them for the stuff that you're probably referring to is for wind excitations, for very uh, skyscrapers. Um, there are, there's some closer similarities to wind engineering, but there you're still dealing with relatively large motions. Um, for instance, one of the class examples of, of, of these TMDs was on John Hancock uh, in Boston, I believe it was, and the issues they were having there. So they had these large motions, which gave them the ability to uh, have large control authority. Um, and you run into a similar thing where you have large motions from an earthquake, where there's also, not in this country, I, don't, I still don't believe there's a practical imp uh, implementation of an uh, active control system, but Japan, there's several. Uh, again, it's a, it's a really nasty event when you have an earthquake, so you get these large motions and you're trying to um, save the building and, and the occupants. Whereas here, it's a nasty event, but it takes a long time to get to it, um, where you have these just not large magnitude deformations, stresses, and so forth. It's a repetitive nature. So um, there are some things, there's definite uh, 
similarities in goals between the two. But the problem we're looking at here is we don't have these large motions to deal with, which is part of the problem. I should also add, we, we did talk about the variety of control systems that are available. Um, we, we tended to gravitate to these dash pot type devices, either um, a, a fluid filled cylinder with a variable orifice or the electro-rheological damper because they're very simple to operate. In one case, you just send an electrical current and the fluid itself responds by becoming more viscous. Or in the other case, you send an electrical signal and the orifice becomes smaller or larger. So they're extremely simple, uh, very easily uh, controlled and therefore less problematic to operate. And uh, the size isn't very large. And we, found, we felt that it would be easier to accommodate that in, uh, in an apparatus at boot ultimately would like to hide so that it's not visible. At this point, we aren't, haven't even tried hiding it. You know, Kathy had some good suggestions there. Uh, we're just trying to see what we can get out of it. Is it, is it worth con continuing to investigate? And so far, the answer seems to be yes. Well, if I might, to your question, sorry, the, the TMDs, the other problem that we can't really use a TMD on these, is a uh, tune mass damper, tune vibration absorber, has this mass. Um, which we just, this is an absorber, so there's no inertia that we're adding uh, for a variety of reasons. One, I don't think you're going to get many bridge owners that are going to allow you to hang, you know, even, even a 100-pound you know, weight off their bridge, let alone what, what's used in, like, the, the wind. These TMDs, I don't know if you're familiar with, but they're massive. I mean, the, the, the mass is on the order of hundreds of tons that either sit on the roof or, well, the roof ones are a little bit smaller, but the base isolation ones for earthquake are just, I mean, they're ridiculously uh, sized. So that's, that's another point, which it seems, yeah. It looks like you, you put your instruments or devices on the bridge to sort of clip the moment that we're in the tie beams, if you will, for the arch rib itself. And so you are improving the characteristics in those ranges. Would it be, do you think continuous structures would have more benefit because you could have a steeper gradient and a, a you know, be able to impact uh, a deeper peak, if you will, in the moment region? It, it is possible. Uh, you know, one of the ways that I've thought about this is in uh, other types of bridges. I mean, once again, I, I'll go back to the fact that we, we selected this bridge because we had a model to start from. <laughs> we didn't have to go through all of that work. But there may be other bridges which have what I'm referring to as the felt area, a larger felt area. A device placed here may have an impact over a larger portion of the bridge. And I think what you're suggesting is something along that lines as well. So um, I think that you know, for this to go further, we would have to investigate other types of bridges as well and see what we could get out of those. Any other questions in the room? And yeah, nothing online? OK, well, very interesting work. Please join me in thanking our presenters today. <laughs>